Hey, hey, everybody. We are live. We are back now for the second episode of What's the Big Idea? My name is Ron Reagan, and it's a super pleasure to be here on the 19th of November to be alive and breathing and excited about the conversation that I'm about to have with the ever fabulous Elizabeth Mendez Berry, who will be my co-dreamer on this episode of What's the Big Idea? So we're going to kick this thing off and get right into it. I'm going to bring Elizabeth in and we'll get started. Hey. Hey. What's up? Not much. How are you? I am great and extremely excited to see you. How are you doing today? I am good and exhausted, but very happy to see you as well. We welcome all of that we are, including exhausted and happy. I like that we can be those things at the same time. <laughs> so it's so good to see you, my friend. I know a lot about you. Why don't you share what you would like to share with folks, knowing that your bio is in the description of the show? What do you want to tell people about who you are, what you're bringing today? Um, well, I'm a friend of Ron Reagan's, which is a delight. Um, and uh, I'm a writer. I'm an editor right now. I work for a company called One World, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House, uh, where I'm an executive editor. Um, but before that, I've been a music critic, a journalist, mm -hmm. um, an activist, a uh, funder, a dreamer. So I've been a lot of those things. And in a number of those roles, I've had the opportunity to overlap with Ron, but probably one of my favorite roles, the thing that I wish I could have done professionally, and I just never figured it out, is to be a backup dancer. So I will, I never wanted to be center stage, but I always just really, really enjoyed basking in the glow of the music. Yes. And dance you do. Okay. So I actually... I don't think I knew that you wanted to be a backup dancer. Maybe that came out at that birthday party of yours I went to once upon a time uh, in that beautiful hotel somewhere in New York. That being said, I have a perennially about to happen EP that I think I'm going to drop at some point in the future. It'll happen. So what you're basically saying is that when I make my first music video, you want to be a dancer in my music video. Is that? I do. <laughs> I should warn you that choreography has never been my thing, but I will. Uh, I would support you in any way I could. <laughs> okay. Listen, we can get somebody to be a choreographer. I'm, I, there could be one of those like Lauren Hill X Factor type scenes where it's just a bunch of beautiful people dancing in a room under blue light. You know, you got on some like fly ass fedora and you know, you're glowing under a black light. I, I can see it already. I'm in, I'm in. Right. And, and matching <laughs> outfits, of course, that's very important to me. Yes. That's my only, I, I don't need stylist. a lot of money. I just need matching outfits and good choreography. Ashe, okay, I think we can make this happen. Um, so for those who ha did not tune in to the first episode live or the recorded version, um, as we introduce ourselves at the top of each WTBI episode, we are leaning into pleasure and we are going to introduce how we are feeling good in our bodies today for y'all who are tuning in. I hope that uh, each of you is also feeling good in your bodies as well as can be. And my invitation to my co-dreamers is what are you eating and or drinking that's bringing you pleasure and or is there something in your environment that you're wearing or otherwise that is bringing you pleasure? So Elizabeth, your friend, what might that be for you? So for me, um, oh, I'm sorry, one second. It's fine, no problem. I'm, I'm... Okay. Old school. Um, yes, indeed. So I'm right now. I'm drinking green tea, which which I love, which gives me a little bit of zing, but not too much because I wanted to be not levitating through this conversation. <laughs> um, I'm wearing a top right now that is a big blue sky, which I thought was a good thing to wear um, when dreaming to mm. think about expanse expansiveness yes. and also um, the beautiful uncertainty or you know the, the 
the big blue yonder that we actually don't know really what's on the other side of mm. um and you know being comfortable being enveloped by that um chocolate definitely plays an important role in my life so I'll, maybe i'll just leave it there <laughs> okay <laughs> nice nice i um <clears throat> I've got a few things. I so I've been quarantine mastery mode of new skills, learning to make gluten-free pancakes. That's been one of my um, endeavors. So you will see me noshing on these banana chai gluten-free pancakes, which I highly recommend. Um, I will share my recipe with those who are interested. I've been, you know tweaking dabbling and i think i got it at this point and i also have this delicious ass bananas foster maple caramel sauce that i put on the pancakes oh my goodness that Get into it. it's a good great. it's a good life um yeah. got my my cold brew it's probably gonna be on every episode um and i'm wearing this beautiful necklace Let's see if I can get it. Mm, yeah, that's probably the best view. Um, I believe it's Onyx that my friend Elmas made. So it's like oh. a talisman to keep the evil away. So is that necklace. is that not to be name dropy, but I just have to ask: Is that the Voices of Our Nations, Elmas? No, this is my yeah. friend Elmas Hader, um, who is based in D.C. and who I met here in New Orleans. Um, mm. Beautiful community organizer artist and um dear dear soul so i just nice. i just picked this up um check out her work um i think she got some holiday sales coming up so i can I, i'll link to her in my bio because i can do that i can do that i'll link in the show notes so y'all go support elmas's beautiful work um oh and i've got on these fun ass pants they're like rainbow colored they're my rainbow bright pants None. That's what we're working with today. Today, today. Um, yeah. So you gave me this wonderful uh, invitation, Elizabeth, to invite folks to set intentions for the conversations that we're going to have. So I would love to know, um, what are you bringing in terms of intentions to our conversation today before we get into our next segment? I think um, my intention is to be expansive in this conversation, to be, to stretch a little bit, because I'm in a moment of my life where I'm feeling a little bit less elastic, mm. and also just to enjoy your company. Awesome. I love it. Um, for me... My intention is to be present and curious um, and to do what I can energetically through these virtual media and across this distance um, to create a, a space that's supportive of those intentions that you just stated, because I like those. And uh, I'm excited to be in space with you too. All right, love train. Let's do it. So <clears throat> again, for those who may be tuning in for the first time or who may have forgot since last week, um, the second part of the show is the, the venting, airing of grievances, getting shit off your chest part of the show. And the intention behind that is to release what we need to release so that we can be present with the dreaming and visioning that we say we want to be about. And so in that spirit and as an offering to do some of that release work, uh, the format is that each of us, Elizabeth and myself, will vent for two minutes. I'm going to set a timer. It's going to be... When it goes off and the, the little alarm sounds, we'll, we'll pause. We will take three deep breaths and focus on that exhale as we release further and deeply into what needs to be released. And then I'll go, same thing, two minutes, releasing with three breaths afterward, and then we'll get into the dream space. 
So, Elizabeth, I'm going to get this timer ready. I'm, I'm just stretching Go before on. I bed. That sounds I, good. I feel like I need to, you know. Prepare. <laughs> yeah. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Your two minutes begins now. So um, I would like to leave behind COVID, which is um, a struggle in my family right now. I would like to leave behind um, the, the presidential transition and the fact that, you know, a coup is afoot and the fact that we don't use that language because of American exceptionalism and all that. Mm. I'd like to leave behind um, the fact that just the way that the Latino vote was characterized, which has really been incensing me because it was very, very, very um, reductionist and monolithic. Mm. And I think is contributing further to a climate of, um, you know, just undermining the, all of the work that has been done to build um, power in those communities. Um, but mm -hmm. it's done in such a way that is not legible to the political establishment or the punditry. Mm -hmm. So those are a few things that um, I'm going to leave behind and also um, lack of sleep. <laughs> Thank you. You're done early. All right. That's cool. Let's do it. Let's um let's breathe together. Let's do some releasing of that and then I'll I'll hop on in here with my thoughts. So um let's find ourselves grounded in whatever way feels good, feet on the floor. We're just gonna inhale and on those exhales, we're gonna focus on the out, the release. So take in a deep breath in and release. Another deep breath in and letting go of whatever needs to be let go of. And another inhale and release. Ah. Ah. All right. And I got to say, for those who are tuning in, I forgot my little preamble, which is that if you need to mute, if you don't want to hear what we got to say, because this is going to be unfiltered, if you think that something might be triggering or uncomfortable for you in a way that is not what you want, then feel free to pause the segment and come back in, fast forward if you're watching the recording, and uh, join us back in the dream space. So, all right, two minutes for me begins now. Let's see. I am... <laughs> Today I'm releasing I don't know. I feel I feel like some residual like perfectionism shit. I think I've been pretty non not in that mode during this time of pandemic. And I yes, this is the thing. I am annoyed <laughs> that people want to get back to quote unquote normal. I'm annoyed that I have so much to do. Now I could say no, but I also need to make money. So blah. I am still learning about boundaries around work and life. And I think I do a decent and reasonable job around that because I can. And yet, like the 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 wheels, yo, are just so churning in this form of capitalism we're in right now. I'm gonna talk about I'm a vent about capitalism probably on every show. I, but I'm just like, can't we just like, people need to take naps, like nap ministry, anybody encouraging folks to rest? Like, uh, if you can, why don't we? Like, I've been thinking like, everybody's like in the nonprofit art sector, which I'm familiar with. Like, we need to, we need to like work, figure this out. I'm like, no, y'all need to like sit down and take a nap. All these funders just need to like pay people to take naps and rest and restore themselves because ain't nobody gonna make no money <laughs> off of theater for a while. It's gonna be it's gonna be a while before you're gonna be able to sustain any sort of a budget on that. So I just, yeah, I wish, I hope everybody takes another break as we get back toward the end of the year. Just, it's time to hibernate. Yeah. All right. 
That's the timer. I don't know where the timer is. It didn't sound. Maybe it's time for silence. Anyway. <laughs> Taking three deep breaths, releasing, inhaling. Ah, releasing that frustration. <laughs> Inhaling and release. <sighs> One last inhale and letting go. <sighs> All right. So my friend, I want to know, what have you been dreaming and or visioning about for our collective future? What's on your heart? What's on your imagination? What's speaking to your spirit right now that's ushering in what we want? Relating to what you just said, what you just shared about napping, I think rest is definitely mm. central to my plans for world domination. I don't know how effective my plan would be given the amount of rest that I'm looking towards, but I have children who who rest every day, mm -hmm. who nap every day, partly because I need them to in order to be able to maintain my professional existence but also it's i just i think it's a, such a great practice to maintain mm -hmm. so that that's really on my mind it's just the and i think you and i've talked before i mean we talk about productivity talk about perfectionism and i really am looking forward to interrogating all of that you know to being able to you know think differently about the volume of work that needs to be produced. This is very granular, but I think it's I think it's actually a really important life shift because people who many people, myself included, to be honest, who are critical of the the capitalism that we live within are still operating, you know, under its rhythms, right? And so I'm really interested in disrupting those rhythms for myself <clears throat> and then thinking about what that might look like for others. That's very big. And then I, as I've been thinking about, you know, this conversation, one of the things that I have been examining is in myself and then also my kids are sort of my, my Buddhist teachers is, mm. you know, the moments where, like the moments when I'm on a dance floor or when I was on a dance floor before the pa pandemic or the moments where, you know, I'm physically stretching and I'm, you know, I'm also sort of emotionally stretching at the same time. All of those moments for me feel like a glimmer of what's possible that I mm. hope to kind of just every time I circle them, get closer and um, sort of understand what it would take to bring those feelings into my day to day more systematically. And, and it's not, you know, a lot of this stuff is magic. A lot of this stuff is not something that you can plan for, but you can create containers, right? You can talk to people like Ron Reagan who are magic incorporated and who um, who I think invite that. And when you are able to sort of invite it and to feel it, it becomes possible to simultaneously be living in the, the constraints of the present and the, and the sort of tantalizing flavor of the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this yeah, sort, of, sort of, oh, little oh, echo. Little echo. Um, Deep embodiment is what it sounds like. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. I, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Um, I might ask you to mute when I'm talking if the echo continues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. But yeah, this sort of like incorporation is such a great word to me. I really like that word. It's, it's sort of been um, muddied a bit in terms of like our conception of it as like corporate 
right? And um, like a business structure of incorporation, but this, this notion of incorporation as to bring into the body, to, to, to embody a thing. Um, and I'm really curious about if you could talk a little bit more about that, these moments of stretching, right? And maybe uh, I think like dancing until we're, we're sweaty and exhausted of, you know, maybe these, these moments where, where we are pushing our bodies in these physical things in these ways that are creating these new spaces, right? That kind of stretching. Um, and, and how you would contrast that kind of physical experience right, to the exhaustion of this like extractive, like on the wheel grinding kind of thing that requires us to make this space for rest. Can you talk about how that might feel different in your body? Um, those two kinds of, of, of work and labor, if you will? Yeah, so this is this is definitely not territory that I talk about a lot. So I'm going to just preface it with apologies for my clumsiness. But it's also that it doesn't always want to be talked about that much because it is so um, physical. And uh, I uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I, um, you know, throughout my life, like I, I so I'm going to offer a trigger warning. I'm just, I'm not going to get into any detail, but I just want to say something important, I think, on this front. As a young person, I had a series, I went through a series of sexual assaults that really um, created a distance between me and my body. And <clears throat> that's all I'll say about that. But just to say that um, I had a hard time coming back into my body and feeling, I felt as if it was a liability or I felt as if it was a, um, you know, a, a traitor in some way, you know, mm. because, because of the way that other people related to it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I was oh, super aware of what was happening, but that was kind of the net result. And so what's, what I think has happened for me, you know, maybe partly as a result of pregnancy too, and having kids and just recognizing the wisdom of my body and its capacity to do all kinds of things that my brain cannot consciously do, I think has been a very, um, just an illuminating experience, you know, of, and so literally when we talk about stretching, there's stretching that I can design for myself, right? There's stretching that right. I can try and do. And then there's stretching that my body just does naturally, right? Like the, mm. the fact that my body, as you saw me, right? I was pregnant with twins. My body just did what it had to do in order to make room for that, for these mm. lives. And so I think that that, that I, you know, that is, you know, a, a specific biological process. Um, and as a person who has, you know, put work into my own healing, a big part of what I've been aiming for is to make my body a part of my life, huh. to really listen to it and huh. to not um, and to not undermine it and also to work with it. Right. Because I think uh -huh. part of it is like, you know, my partner right now just, you know, uh, what did he do? He, some, his back, he hurt his back really badly and he can't move, you know? And why did that happen? It happened because he wasn't doing the exercises that he needs to do to strengthen himself and to take care of his spine and all those things. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like all of those, that, that is a super visceral message where your body's like, hey, kill me. <laughs> you can't ignore me. You can't forget about me. And why don't you actually learn from me, you know? Yeah. And so I think like my, one of my big goals for the past few years has been to exercise with the goal of building not partly strength, right, for, from a, but partly flexibility. And yeah. the, because I realize also when I think about my ideas and how kind of attached I can become to them and how, you know, on one level I think of myself as being flexible, but in many ways I'm not, you know, and what can my body do that my brain can't do yet? And what can my brain do that my body can't do yet? And those are just some of the things that, I, that I've that i been kind of thinking about. Also, I do a lot of hula, hula hooping, which I may have told you, which has been the thing that has gotten me through the pandemic because it's very, you know, it's small, yeah. it's deep. And, and it's been great, you know, and just even the fact of learning, like the first time I tried it, I 
I couldn't hold it. You know, I had mm. totally forgotten how to do it from being a kid. And now I can do it forever. And my daughter can do it better. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, ugh, okay. So many things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, that was really invigorating. I'm like writing down so many little nuggets of intrigue and wisdom. Um, I really appreciate your articulation of this, of things happening inside of us that are beyond language, that that are ineffable, that where, where language fails us. And um, I'm thinking about um, some wisdom from Anna Devere Smith, the theater artist who spent, and among many things, theater artist, performer, researcher, teacher, uh, who work really centered around interviews, at least for a time, and and then retelling in creative ways and in embodied ways the the these experiences that, that people were having, often very charged ones around violence, the healthcare system, et cetera. Um, that's what I know of Anna Devere Smith's work. I hope I'm not butchering it too much. But I do remember a quote and or a a, a really brilliant thought and practice that she observed in her interviews with people, I, I heard her talk about this somewhere, where she talks about what, what I'm remembering or and or I'm going to describe as the break. These moments in interviews where people are talking about their experiences, thoughts or feelings, and, and then language fails them and they can't find the words for the thing. And, and in her practice, if I'm remembering correctly, she was like, that's when things get really good. That's when I know something is coming. And then I think about so many, like, I always have a sort of black feminist, like, chorus inside and around me, I would say, right? Th these moments where we, we understand the, the, ineffab the ineffability of something. I, 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 maybe another thing with this show is going to be, I'm going to think about and talk about Audre Lorde quite a bit. But right, th this notion that, like, also, the search for the language is its own journey, but some things just have to be like they they can't be described. So I what I, what I heard you point to, I don't know if you didn't say this, I don't think, but that that there's a practice, almost like a dialectic mind body, right? And those are connected. We know they're connected. They are they are the same entity. There are different pathways to experience, um, but that that our bodies make room for dreaming. Like they do that naturally, right? If we are resting well and we get sleep in an adequate fashion, we are dreaming whether we realize that we are dreaming or not, whether we consciously remember we're dreaming or not. And so also you're sharing your story of pregnancy as this reconnection to your body, as its, its ability to make room for two now young little babies they're not young. They're almost six. Um, they're still young. They're young to me. I don't know. They're not quite babies anymore. Um, but so anyway, I'm talking too much. This is about a shared space. So I, 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 but I would love to hear you talk a bit more about whether you see a connection between the bodies constantly doing this work and this, the body's ability to make space and how that might relate to dreaming and visioning. Like, are our bodies making space for that? How do we do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I love what you said. And I, I do want to say one thing about pregnancy, which is very important to say, yes. whether you are into it, you want it, don't want to have had it. But it's also a complete nightmare <laughs> in many ways. Like it's not the it's not always a joyful and a dreamy experience, you know, sure. when you're building humans. So I, I think I do think it's really important to say that because there is that sort of romance around it, which I think is not not always um, accurate, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that um, I am sort of playing with in my own um, ideas about where we need to get to and what's possible is, and I, I not, not, not to fetishize nature in any way, but just just to say that I, I, I think, at least for myself, the moments when I've had the most distance from my body 
mm. have been the moments of um, the the most awful moments of my life. You know, and there there it was those things were related, right? I I had I I felt like I had to um, break the relationship in a certain way because it was it was too painful, um, and you know that that I think obviously different people, different survivors or whatever it is, you know, and it had different relationships to that, but that was my experience. Yeah. And then I think when, you know, those moments where I could be in sort of harmony or in um, presence. And if, even just like one thing is the way that it feels to when you're in the pocket as a dancer or as a musician or something, and you're mm. just, you know, you're in flow. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I, I always uh, listen, you know, your, your black feminist chorus probably has a lot more to say about this than I do. Cause this is, this is definitely not the territory that I, that I spent a whole lot of time in, oh, but we can all but, be in that territory together. Yes. Yeah. But, um, but I do think that, you know, we, we, you know, when, when people ask about your gut feeling, right. My gut is usually right about mm. things. I don't always have language for that. And in fact, even though, you know, I could talk at length about the the decision that I've made in my life to pursue language as, as a, mm. a mechanism to guide us yes. towards justice, towards joy, towards a, a different kind of future. I also feel very strongly the limitations of language. And I don't say that in the sense of, not limitations in the, in the sense of um, necessarily problematic limitations mm. but just that i actually feel as if and maybe this is what anna duvere smith is getting at when you're sort of groping towards something and it's not familiar and you can't place it mm -hmm. that is a place of enormous sort of possibility mm -hmm. and disorientation and i think disorientation is necessary to possibility mm. you know? Um, and I think that, you know, when you, when, for those of us who have maybe a few bumper stickers or a few t-shirts in us that like t-shirt slogans that we say a lot or that we think a lot or, um, and then we get, that gets destabilized and we're maybe forced to engage with a different feeling or sort of grope towards, you know, what the sensation is or what the possibility is. I, I, I believe that all of that is us kind of it it's it's pushing us towards the the sensation and not the categorization of the sensation and I, i'm i'm curious about the possibilities there you know come on preacher <laughs> come on groping so toward third... possibility sensation without categorization okay that's yes, 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 yes. I, um, I can I ahead. say one other thing? Yes, please. no, I was just gonna say, I feel like I feel like we live in a society that teaches us to lie to ourselves and to lie to our bodies, you know. Mm. And so, mm. the point at which we can, like, you know, my kids they don't lie to themselves, you know, they don't lie to their and but they're gonna learn to do that, you know, and that's mm. something that I as a parent, I'm so um, troubled by, you know, because I feel like they now have a degree of wisdom about what they want, what they like, what they don't like, you know, just, yeah. or, and more than anything, I think they have an adventurous spirit about their relationship with what their body can do and what wow. they can do, you know, within that. And so, um, so if, if we live in a society that is invested in, in distancing us from the, the sensations that are most true to our experience, mm -hmm. what do we need to do to come back in and to allow those sensations to guide us? And I think that that's the place where all of us have a different sort of geography of truth. But for me, the geography of truth is um, what I feel when I just am not, and I mean, especially in the context of music, it's so, potent and that I think is what guides me and, and gives me hope. 
Man, I'm gonna have to listen to this at least like three times because this is you are you are thick despite your exhaustion with like some serious some serious gems. Ah, I don't even know where to that. What makes you move in the ways that you're describing? What music gets you in that space? What is what are those musical portals to be stretching? reintegrating with your body experience. What is that for you? What gets you going? Um, I would say house music, definitely. Um, so I listen to like, uh, mm -hmm. I, Armand, I, my my sweetie videotaped me and I don't know what, like I was wearing pajamas <laughs> and I don't know what, but I just danced around the entire house. Um, yes. And yeah, so that that's a really big one. I mean, I think the music that I grew up listening to the music that really sort of you know summoned summoned me in, in mm. that way um is cumbia which is a four four colombian rhythm deep 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 um drum Love it. and clarinet and um you know just in the vocal it's like there's a lot of standards and so you mm. you hear the standard and it's like you know performed by different people but it just any one of those just has that effect on me. And also because, um, you know, Latin music, a lot of people dance it in a very rigid way. So people dance like salsa, like, you know, all that. And I can do that and I like doing that, but I, I was raised in a much more free form kind of way. I mean, the rhythm was, you know, the rhythm was central, but then what you did with it was kind of your own business. So yeah. that's really big. And then hip hop too. I mean, I, I really like dancing to hip hop, not all of it, obviously, but, but some of it really mobilizes me and old soul records too. But I have, I, um, I think, um, I think house for me is the one that in a club setting has mm. been the most liberatory. Um, yes, indeed. and I think that a big part of that, in addition to the quality of the music and it's, you know, it's, soulfulness and also just the seamlessness of the mix and you just feel like you're enveloped by it um is just also that it's you know a lot of times it's a queer space it's a space of um you know just a completely different sexual dynamic where um you know for me I could just be completely you know if I was in a in a, a Latin club it's like it would feel more predatory and in the mm. house club felt that way unless it was a gay latin club in which it was great <laughs> um ah so you know I, what i really love house music too for me um has been such a astrally projecting space that like i just i once i'm in it like some beat drops some moment happens and then three hours later i'm just like where have i been ah i miss a specific party called the people in oakland this was like 20 teens like 2010 11 12 or something maybe 2009 even i don't know when i started going but um it was it was the most beautiful space it was such a beautiful an intergenerational space like very black and poc space like people were selling things like a lot of these artisans and craft people um, all mostly, mostly black folks selling where it was just like family. And I would go in there and just, yeah, nothing predatory, very queer. And like, it was just the most loving space. So house music parties with that sort of energy have been absolutely transformative spaces. Like spaciousness was a part of what was happening in, in those, yeah. those clubs. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, I started, I went, so I studied in Toronto and I would go, I would go, there were Latin house parties. There were, you know, there were all kinds of house, but I just think that, you know, I always think, I always think about the political potential of house music and, mm. you know, I have a tendency to think about the political potential of everything. So that may or may not be, but, but I do, I just, I feel like the, um, It, the the on the one hand the, for me anonymity you know and on the other mm -hmm. hand total feeling of you know being seen even though you're and not seen and seen and not seen and kind of the um 
it's just and you know being part of a mass yeah. i mean i think forever that's why when i was when i was starting uh as a writer i was writing about music and the thing that always got to me is like you know it just inhabits your body you know and that, again that to me relates to this point about how um how we escape the the tyranny of the the brain or you know just the degree to which we dwell here mm -hmm. which is just such a small percentage of of who we are you know yeah. and when you're when you're in the music in that way and when you're communing with other people without ever having to say mm. anything to them but you just are like you know you could be next to somebody else you may never speak to them may never see them again but there's this feeling of of oneness and momentum and sh and like you're inside the rhythm together you know and it's inside you yeah yeah it's sort it 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 breaks down boundaries in this way that is so unique in the way that vibrations do um ah uh, yes um i was just gonna say one of, i'm gonna send you this mix i don't know if i've sent it to you before from dj mother cyborg out of detroit it's like <laughs> no i, I would remember a house and it is so good it is one of my favorite it's like cumbia house with like a bunch of like 80s like pop and and, and hip-hop it's and really it's really and, delicious yeah yeah, yeah yeah um and then have we talked about combo chimbita they're this no. uh like uh colombian afro-colombian ensemble out of brooklyn and they do a lot of like surf. It's like for me, it feels like surf rock cumbia, and it's it's just dope as shit. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna hit you up. Awesome. Now. Awesome. Um, but oh yes, okay. See, this is the thing. We knew we could talk for like three hours. Um, I know. <laughs> we're in, we're inside of um uh, of our time. So I I feel like we've already started. Like there's there's so much um there's so many places we could go. And this is a place we've been, but I want to put a, like explicitly talk about, um, I think particularly because you've been talking about this feeling that COVID has, like this feeling that our political context has, this sort of pressure, weight, the, the cloister, right? And part of what I'm interested in, like I don't want to be overly pragmatic in this space of WTBI, um, I don't want us to preoccupy ourselves with how we do get from A to B. I really want to be thinking like A to post the alphabet, right? And yet, I do think there are practices that we can engage in right now to help us be in dreaming and visioning space. And even when it feels inaccessible sometimes, or even when the weight of pragmatism feels very heavy and necessary and immediate. So the ask of you is, how do you practice and or make space for dreaming and visioning in your life? Even like we can't go dancing like we were, we've been talking about, right? Yeah. So, so what, are, what, are, what are you doing, even small experiments to make that possible for you right now? So that's a great question. And I have two ways I could, could and would love to answer it. Um, okay. One of which has to do with the, the little bitty stuff. And then one of which has to do with the way I'm thinking about my project in the world so i can do either i want to hear both, both. okay <laughs> um so I, I think in terms of um the the question about how say it again the way that you said it about just like the day-to-day -day stuff that you could do do you remember yeah like what are, what are like some day-to-day -day practices to make space for dreaming and visioning in your life yeah so i mean i'll tell you i am not operating on <laughs> I'm not at my best right now the reality is like I'm I'm dealing with a lot of just family stuff and and all. so I think the thing that I the thing that I do try to do that is always I mean even just the the breathing that we did a little bit earlier for me that's a big that's just a big come back come back into the body mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. if I can meditate I meditate if I can take a walk I take a walk um if I can I had Syrian food yesterday and they used a lot of preserved lemon and I really tasted it and I was really kind of happy to be able to taste it and recognize it and and enjoy it. You know, that was instead of just like, you know, scarfing it down, which definitely happens for me. Mm. Um, 
One thing that one of our the authors that we work with, uh, who wrote the Undocumented Americans, uh, Carla Cornejo y de Vicencio, she was like, you know, I don't really attach my hopes and dreams to politicians, or she's like, but my coffee, on the other hand, I attach a lot to because yes. every day my coffee gives me what I need. Every day my coffee. You know, she has her specific blend that she buys. She smells it. She drinks the first gulp. And she talked about that with a reverence that I really appreciated. And and I think those are the kinds of things that I'm trying to bring in as much as I can. And then I think, as I mentioned, my kids are kind of my little Buddha humans because yes. they, um, first of all, they want to play all the time. And just watching them and just realizing, how as adults we don't really play very much you know what i mean or mm. if we play it's in a very specific context and it's um you know so it's just it's fun to and you know they won't really take no for an answer when it comes to play so <laughs> you know i'm definitely playing i'm playing and i'm doing it anyway so i may as well enjoy it so that's part wow. of yeah and then in terms of the other the sort of thinking about it more macro um, and Ron, feel free to, to jump in if this is not the right direction. But I think I'm always trying to think on multiple tracks, right? I'm thinking mm -hmm. on crisis response. Um, so one of the things I mentioned that I was pissed off about was the way that the Latinx vote was understood and publicized and all that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I wrote a letter to the editor and then I helped a friend get a, an op-ed published. And then I, like, I tried to do tangible, specific things that I could do to, to address that, right? Yeah. Am I going to change everything? No, but at, at the very least, it, you know, there were a couple of things that I could do. And then there's sort of medium term dreaming, which is... Um, which could be, you know, strategically thinking about what's needed in order to create a more ex expansive vision of what a Latinx person is, what their life experiences are, mm -hmm. that isn't either, you know, criminal or, you know, the, the, the rapist or whatever the, the, the terms that the president had offered. And then the long term, the sort of the long game, from my perspective, because I'm now working in books and books, it takes years to produce them, right? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what are you, you're not thinking about like this presidential crisis or that you're thinking mm. about what are the stories, not the policies, not what are the stories and the characters and the people mm. whose lives we need to understand in order to understand ourselves better. Hmm. 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 No, this is this is a great direction. And I wonder if there's another question too, in thinking about the timeline for books. What are the characters, stories to understand each other better that need to get out into the world? And what are the characters and stories that are going to help us make the new world that we want to be in? What are the characters and stories that are going to help make that space that we've been talking about, right? In our bodies, in our imaginations, in our consciousness, in our subconscious, in our desires that, that engender a whole other realms of being that we can't imagine. And, and maybe that's part of the work too, is to, it's for me it feels like a both end right it feels like yes we need to transform the narratives we have now because many of them are violent and destructive and terrible right and what about narratives we don't even know yet right that are beyond our language and i think artists are doing both of those things Absolutely. and i'm really interested in the beyond yeah i mean i think <laughs> It's just so it's so interesting because I think that like the the point that I I don't know how successful I was with this, but the point that I'm trying to make when I'm when I'm talking about the moment of flow on the dance floor and this yeah. kind of I think that's the few I hope that's the future. You know, I hope mm. the future is us being, you know, and whatever that is for you, you know, to be in the I use the term in the pocket because yeah. for me that's evocative. Yeah. It could be flowing. It could be whatever the thing is. But basically when you are in a state of um, sort of abandon in the, in the best way, you know, just being 
in in the moment or what yeah. that's what it is for me it's, presence. I, it's, right presence full, that's, that's exactly joyful presence right and so the thing is i don't on one level i think about you know a mystical future and on another level i believe it already is here yes. with us. and so to me the thing is um and it was with our ancestors and it will be mm. with our you know with our great 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 grandchildren or whatever it is like it's it, it i don't yeah. i don't necessarily see these ideas as outside of us mm -hmm. i see them as deep within and a question of us kind of like i said i think everybody maybe has a different geography of truth you know geography of presence geography of peace geography of joy whatever whatever the right term is for you and i think the the like how do we fill in that map how do we understand it and whether we understand it in our heads or we understand in our gut or in our heart so the thing that i think about with the the publishing is like who are the people who live in touch with that you know yes. and so yes. one of the things that i i one of the projects that i'm really hopeful about is um well I, I, I'm just going to say I love this person's work and I dream that there will be a book in the future, whether, but her, her project is called um, Veterana San Rucas and it is a project um, where she documents, excuse me one second, no estoy, estoy ocupada, mi amor, estoy en una llamada, te vas y para que tú no vinieras, vete, vete, sorry. I love it. Hi. No, <laughs> um, but anyway, so the the whole the that project is about celebrating uh, Latina women, Chicana women in LA in the nineties. They go to clubs. They hang out. They are fly. They are fabulous. They are fascinating, right? Yes. And they have built a community around you know just their their own community celebrating themselves. And I just see that, and I see the beauty of it, and I'm like they figured some things out, you know? Mm. And I think actually that we don't know about them. Most people don't know about them because for deliberate reasons, I think that their story is not a story that is, has been made available, that has been invested mm -hmm. in and all those things. So part of my job, I think, hmm. is to find those stories mm -hmm. and to think about how they might project into the future, you know, yeah. and how they continue to live and they continue to teach us um, you know, in similar way, like, you know, like Buddha, like there, there, there are philosophers, there are writers, there are all these people who I've learned so much from and who I also hope that I will have the opportunity to, you know, it's just a, it's like, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's not a product. There's no one, um, voice that is going to answer all the questions, but I think that part of the work of a, of a publisher is to shine a light on those on those stories in hopes that they might give us something to carry into the future and to help us understand how we ourselves can live with that same level of grace and eloquence and rebellion. All right. I could I yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to say yes and yes. That's what I'm going to say. Um <laughs> Yay. Okay. Um, I can't believe we almost talked for an hour. Um, this is beautiful. I'm so grateful. And uh, in the spirit of sharing and um, thank you for your generosity. I wonder if there are any resources or inspirations that you have that are that are moving you into to dreaming any sort of media things you're encountered in the world things you return to regularly that you want to point folks to as touchstones of imagination for you absolutely and um so one that has just been on my mind in the past couple of days that it comes back up for me every so often is this poem by pablo Neruda about a cat and and it's um i i'm not going to do it justice so i'm not going to try and remember it but it's just about the idea of being completely within your skin mm. and um it's it's very beautiful and the edition i have is in spanish and in english and it's just very luxurious and feline and and also i think philosophically 
um, very compelling. So that's mm. one. Um, the Terenas and Rucas, I love. I love New Yorkinos. Um, so I can I can share those with you as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited about a book called Black Futures, which is coming out very shortly. It's edited by Jenna Wortham and Kimberly Drew, and it is mm. Shazam. You know, it it is a lot of what we're talking about. It's dreaming into yes. the future and contending with the problems of the present, but not being confined by them. Yes, Ashe. Awesome. Um, I, I feel like one of the through lines I'm anticipating from these conversations is this both and disillusion of time in that we are the future both in the sense that we are doing these little experiments now, these everyday practices of imagining and space making and, and projecting ourselves forward and our communities forward, our families forward, our loved ones forward. So we are, we are, we are crafting futures. We are being futures right now. And we are someone's past future, right? We are some people, entities, beings that someone prayed forward, dreamed about, imagined, conjured, crafted, um, envisioned, embodied. Um, and we are someone else's past right now. So I love how complex this is already getting. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so good. It's so yeah. I don't so feel like I helped you with that one. <laughs> no, you did. I mean, that, that your your comments basically um, helped me see that that's likely to be a through line in these conversations. That we are the future in our present. So I am grateful for you. Thank you so much for being here. Do you want to tell us about where people can share their monetary expressions of gratitude, also known as donations? Sure. Um, so I, I am a big fan of Black Voters Matter, which is an incredible organization um, that is, you know, present and future dealing mm. with what's happening right, right now um, in terms of voter suppression and, and mobilization of voters, but also building big dreams and possibilities for the future. Um, so I'm a big, big fan of their work. And great. I got to shout out specifically Latasha Brown, who's one of the all time greats, both as an organizer and as an artist. She's an amazing um, musician as well. Great. Yes, y'all, please um, direct any monetary expressions of gratitude to Black Voters Matter Fund.org slash donate. Um, Big gratitude to my friend Elizabeth Mendes Berry for being so generous in your storytelling and imagining with us. I'm so excited that we're gonna take a week off and we'll be back on December 3rd with the amazing Ebony Noel Golden to do some more dreaming and visioning and talking about the future present. And I'm just grateful. I feel super lit up and excited. I'm gonna go enjoy some sunshine and uh, be by a body of water, then go to the bayou. So thanks, Elizabeth. Best Thank of you. luck on all the healing and space making that you are going to be doing. Space is the place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Sunra. Okay, peace, everybody. Take care. Thanks. We'll see y'all in two weeks. Bye.